So um, we're going to start right now with the um, next panel, um, which is who wants yesterday's charts, um, music charts in real time. So I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion about how technology um, like streaming service or companies like Twitter or Shazam um, transform in a way the, the concept of music charts and how will it be in the future. So the host will be um, Ralf Nimczek, a very experienced music journalist, wrote nearly for everything uh, um, what you can have in, in music magazines here in, in, in Germany and right now is an editor at Rolling Stone. So, and I guess you will introduce your panel experts. So, okay. thanks you. So, this panel will be in English uh, with a German accent, uh, but uh, I hope you can understand us. So, um, we just start. Um, this panel here changed a bit uh, because of uh, delays uh, on planes, but I think um, the people here are competent people and we're discussing facts, figures and technology. So, just start was a guy from Shazam, from London. Uh, how important is a very traditional chart system? I think it's established by Billboard magazine in the 20s or 30s in America, in a very traditional way. Now we have, I don't know, hundreds of listing charts. Every radio station has their own chart system. So how important is for an app-based uh, technology like Shazam, the classical chart system and maybe your own chart system? Yeah, no, I think um, charts have been an increasingly important part of our business, especially over the last few years as Shazam has continued to grow. Um, you know, in terms of scale now, we're at 100 million monthly active users. So, you know, if you're at uh, the top of the worldwide Shazam charts, it's a very healthy number. Um, and, you know, it's quite uh, topical while we're in Berlin um, that Robin Schultz is the first German artist to make it as the number one Shazam track in the world at the moment. Um, time quite nicely. But um, so, I don't know, I think we see our charts very much um, sitting in a slightly different area to traditional sales charts. It's more of a predictive tool. Um, you know, we tend to predict a hit on average two months in advance. Um, and it's become quite important now for artist managers, but then also radio programmers as well. Um, radio One, especially in the UK, uh, uses Shazam as you know one of several uh, tools to, uh, to to pick out what moves up the playlist. Um, so yeah, I think back to your question, I think we, we sit in a slightly different position, almost accompanying the sales chart in a, uh, you know, t to get your phone out and to Shazam something, it shows a, a real kind of moment of engagement. Um, so it is, it, it helps, I think, labels in terms of kind of knowing what, what kind of a hit they have on their hands. Um, I think there's been certain, especially certain artists this year, breakout artists such as Magic, such as Robin Schultz, such as Robert Oliver Heldens, who um, labels always think they have and know they have a special artist when they sign them. Um, but Shazam shows them that they, they are, you know, they're actively people out there engaging with that music. Do you have uh, an all-time favorite hit list? Because Shazam is a, a music or hit or song identifying program. And I think a lot of people... Uh, looking for older tracks and have you, uh, I don't know, uh, the 20th century favorite old school track list or something? So you mean say, I guess to use the term legacy music? Uh, yeah. So it, it's kind of, the key to Shazam's uh, data is, is generally exposure. So we do see older tracks um, such as say, uh, you know, on the other panel out there, they were referencing Fleetwood Mac, and Fleetwood Mac track were, were everywhere was used on a um, mobile phone advert in the UK, um, and that in turn increased in Shazam activity, and then increased in sales activity as well. And we can pretty much determine the reason why that was was because it was used in that advert. Um, so I'd say for older tracks like that, you you definitely need to see a probably a, a sync, whether in an advert or or a film or a TV show. Um, but we've we've seen the interest in that, so we now produce the sync chart in the UK. We partner with the Drum, who are a leading advertising uh, magazine. Um, so you know, advertising networks can see what the most popular Shazam adverts are. So Felix, uh, I know Twitter as a short messages service. Uh, where is a chart listing in Twitter? Well, I think. Um 
what, what John's saying, like we, I think Twitter is like at the beginning of the whole thing because like when you listen to music on your computer, you're not going to get on your phone and shazam the song because you've got it already there, right? And um, and as people, when they they walk around, so if if I want to like for example shazam a song or if the song's already in the charts, it's got airplay. It's got like it's on an advert, it's on the radio, it's playing in a in a shop or something like that. And I guess on Twitter we see like it's more discovery thing. So people discover a new song and they want to share that. Or an artist shares uh, their song, and then um, people pick that up and they talk about a song. So we can kind of, we, I think we come before that. So, so we kind of predict trends. Like you can, like through Twitter, you can kind of see which artist is gaining traction by mentions, which songs are gaining traction, which are being shared. So I think, I think we come kind of like first step before it goes like in the shops or like online and then people like Shazam it and then it goes in the charts. So the monitoring is about the wording in the short messages. If it there is Fleetwood Mac, you count how many Fleetwood Macs are mentioned in a day, in a week? For example, for okay. example. I mean, it's quite quite complicated algorithm and, um, and you know, that, that's out there. But yeah, we basically, we, we check that and we check, we can also check like what, what artists is getting traction if they release a new song, people talking about the song, talking about the artist, talking about an album, you know, that kind of thing. Like if they're on tour, we can, I mean, we can measure everything because people, you know, it's kind of engagement, you get with Shazam, people getting out the phone. We get engagement people they want to talk about. They want to talk about an artist, about a song, about an album. And uh, we can measure that. We can see that. That people want to talk about it and they share it. So that we can measure that, yeah. So in comparison to uh, the others, uh, Spotify is, uh, from their point of view, a, a classical media thing. Because you are kind of a radio station. Uh, you can count the tracks. Uh, uh, I see there are charts. Uh, what is the uh, uh, most listened song in Gütersloh or whatever? So uh, I think uh, how many chart listings uh, on Spotify uh, are existing in our days? I think for, for Spotify, it's mainly three things where we work with charts. So one thing is our own Spotify chart, so where we measure how many streams per day are coming from a country. So that's our main chart, and that's also something where our users discover a lot of music. I think the main difference to when we talk about the official German charts is that we at Spotify, we don't talk about purchasing, we're talking about consumption. So that's a little bit different and something you really have to get your head around when you, when you start about talking about streaming because purchasing is a one-off one act and streaming and listening to music is something that happens every day or every second. Um, then, of course, we're reporting our consumption into the, into the German official charts, so we're part of that. And uh, which is something which we are developing and something we're looking at is in how, we can, how can we make charts even more interesting, more viral and more individual as well. So what we did is inventing something that we call the viral charts. So it's not only the amount of streams that are happening, but also the amount of streams that are shared out of the Spotify client, which are shared on uh, Twitter, Facebook or on our own social system. So that's something, it's, it's a factor that says... Um, how much of the streams getting, is getting shared. So that's something we're looking at when we're uh, looking for new artists we want to work with, for example. So it's an important, um, it, it's getting more important for the industry as well to look at the, our viral charts as well. So Manfred, uh, you're coming from the old school where the traditional charts in Germany or in Europe are put together from sales and radio. Uh, could you please uh, explain um, because our day charts, I don't know if, uh, how it works in other countries, but in Germany it's a pastiche or a mix of different sources. Sales, radio and all the digital things. Well, we have uh, the official charts which are based on sales and transactions, uh, basically. And they've been changing all along uh, because whenever a new format was established, they tried to change the rules accordingly to uh, just get a uh, well uh, as possible as good as possible a picture of what's going on there uh, airplay charts is something different because that's more into the direction consumption and not uh, sales um, and yeah it's I was hoping I could tell something more because they were gonna announce uh, something today they, uh, about the change in the German official chart system, and maybe we'll get this information in yeah, so uh, while we're here. Maybe we are uh, can do 
a sensational new thing. I don't that know. Would be uh, what great, do you think yeah? about uh, what will change? That the uh, mix of the chart will change, or uh, Some, an yeah, earthquake something like charts. that will change. I, I don't. I don't want to uh, do, do, do speculations about it. Uh, it has to be said also that uh, the official charts is a uh, is a rule book of about 50, 60 pages, and. Uh, you always have to look it up if you want to understand the details because they've been changing all, all the way and, and there's so many things which are trying to uh, fix this system. And for me, it's like, uh, well, it's, it's a dichotomy. dichotomy. Uh, we have on one hand the consumption, the, the Twitter, the Seshazam and, and so on, and that's like the magic of the moment and that's quite important because you have to to look at something uh, real time as, as possible and then you probably know what's going to be happening uh, with the sales later on. Uh, we always had these trend charts also in the official charts, but way well, back then it was trend charts that were done by, well, the, the old Stone Age charts were done by listings uh, with, a, with, a, uh, with the shops and, and they, they, they gathered all these lists and they, they tried to, 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 to find a trend out of this and then it was the trend charts with the airplays and you knew that if, if a new single was released and it got 1,500 airplays in a week, then you knew this would, would, would uh, translate into sales sooner or later. Before the digital age, it would be more uh, rather later than sooner. Uh, but uh, that, that's the magic of the moment. And on the other hand, and that's still why the official charts are quite important, it's also the, the, the beauty of actual sales, the beauty of money. And that's the, uh, the, the basics of, of the music industry. So for me, the big question is how to translate this magic of the moment into the beauty of figures. So in the how end. do you translate it, the magic of the moment? <laughs> That's a big question. But, uh, so in, in what sense, I mean, how do you, so let's just, uh, how do we do it, Shazam, or how do we do it, any, anyone? No, do I think, uh, <laughs> do you work together with the official, I don't know, BPI in England, or with the official uh, uh, things from, from the traditional music industry and all. I think in, in Germany uh, the charts is media control and media control is owned uh, by the biggest uh, marketing research company I think in Europe. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are, uh, have the, um, the systems to monitor but you guys have your own monitoring system and so maybe there is a fight and they, oh what we say is true and they say no, 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 our rules are true or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point. I mean, obviously the big switch in, in UK charts specifically recently was the addition of streaming. Um, and that's a fairly new thing that's happened. Um, so, you know, sh yeah, Shazam data doesn't, isn't part of the official UK charts. Um, not to say that it won't be in the future, but it isn't right now. Um, I think that the fact as well that we aren't, even though you can purchase music through the app, we don't sell music directly. So it's still very much, we're almost like the middleman to, to let people connect to the music. And whether they choose to buy it or not is up to them. And then if they choose to buy it, then that will go to, towards the charts. So speaking about differences in Europe, Spotify is very mighty in Sweden, Scandinavian countries. Uh, I don't know this. Is there is a Spotify chart over there the official charts or is there uh, an official Swedish charts from I don't know GFK Sweden or whatever? Yeah, there are still official Swedish charts, but I think we make like 90% percent of the Swedish ma market. And so, so is there a similar. difference between the so-called sales charts and your charts? In Sweden um, or in Norway? I would say it doesn't differ too much because in Sweden we are such a mainstream product that pretty much everyone uses it, so it shouldn't be too different. So how important is Helene Fischer in Germany for the Spotify charts? Uh, quite important, actually. So um, Helene Fischer is a special case because her record wasn't available on Spotify for quite a long time. Why? So because she didn't it. want to be streamed. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we just we just launched the record, and we saw a lot of interest actually from a fan base, which um, is probably not a typical Schlager audience, but much yeah. younger audience as well. And she performs really well on a service. She's of course not, let's say, in the top 20 of our of our daily charts, but she's quite close. 
Uh, would you agree, because it said in, in Germany it's a special market, over there uh, it's nearly 70% uh, still CDs and a bit of vinyl, that traditional uh, genres like Schlager are the ones who are sold in the shops and the more modern or younger is more in digital media. Would you agree to this? Yes, I, w I would definitely say that we, we see that a lot of genres which are considered more in a younger audience, let's say dance or, or urban hip-hop, especially young German hip-hop, are performing extraordinarily well on our, our platform. There's is a good example we just did with Kollega from Germany. He was on the number one of our global charts as a German artist, only because of yeah, streams from Germany. He's the fastest Germany. rapper in the world. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so it was, it, he, he had more streams worldwide than Avicii worldwide, so that was pretty impressive. So we definitely see that some genres are very strong on streaming because we have a very, very young audience. And we see that some um, older genres where I would also say it's more like mainstream radio um, artists, like more in the rock niche, they, they have quite a bit, they have their difficulties to what perform. What is about, uh, let's say, death metal or some medieval gothic sub-genres? Yeah. Uh, is this existing on Spotify too or are there traditionalists? I think it's, it depends on the territory we're in. So in, in Sweden, for example, where of course metal is a huge genre, which is a niche genre, but it's very big, they can, they can get on our top list of our charts directly. We also had a surprising uh, campaign with the, the band Sabaton, which is a metal band, and they did a very interesting thing. They did release one song per day uh, in prior to their album, so every day there was a new song that was being added, and their fans are really loyal, so metal fans really get back to a record when there's a new thing that they can, they can listen to. And that record hit our charts on number 10, so that was quite su surprising for us to see that we are now getting into a mainstream audience where these niche topics can hit our Spotify chart as well. So with Twitter, who is doing the monitoring, looking for Fleetwood Mac in the, is this a machine or uh, something, a, a robot or is there, are there in India or whatever or in uh, somewhere people sitting in a huge office looking for Fleetwood Mac? That would be nice, wouldn't it? No. Um, no, no, it's, it's algorithm based and, um, and we're working with labels that, that um, program these algorithms. Um, I think it's quite interesting, I think the point we're hitting in the discussion now is I think what I'm here sitting is like, what are we actually measuring when we talk about charts? Yeah. Because, um, you know, you were saying like, you know, really you want to measure like, like sales and um, with Shazam, you, you measure people being interested in the song, right? I listen to a song and I think I like that. What is it? Because I want to know what it is. I go to Spotify and I consume, I don't want to buy them. I want to listen to the songs and I can, because I have them directly. On Twitter, it's the same thing. I talk about stuff I'm interested in. So really what we're, I think, seeing is the charts pivoting a bit because uh, when we started with the charts, the only thing we could measure was people buying records. That was like your consumption was what you were buying. And what you could do is, I remember when I was uh, a couple of years ago still a DJ, like the GFK still sent out these like uh, sheets of paper where you could cross on which kind of songs you were playing and what you thought was going to be big. And you gave like feedback to the labels and stuff. You know, and that was like a very, very old school thing to do. And, uh, and now with all the digital things, we can actually measure what people are actually interested in, like what they like, you know, what, what triggers either to tweet about it, to Shazam a song or to, to stream it. So really what, we're, what I think we have to get our head around is that charts is not so much about Con like buying music, but it's more about popular music. Like, what are we interested in? What's what's the user interested in? And then, the really interesting thing is what I find interesting about Shazam is like that that sometimes translate into people actually buying the music, right? So I listen to it, and I listen to a song. It's like Fleetwood Mac. It's I don't know an advert, and I go, oh, Fleetwood Mac, nice. You know, never heard of it, little kid, and goes and, and goes to iTunes, whatever, and, and buys the Fleetwood Mac song. Probably just the one song might not even buy the whole album because we also see that people are not buying albums anymore. They're just like interested in the song. Or they go on Spotify and they kind of, and you know, they listen, uh, they listen to the song, they stream it, and then they might stream the whole album and go, oh, this is really nice. But they're not going to go out and buy the CD or, God forbid, buy the vinyl uh, because, you know, they're not doing it anymore. But what they might do is, or what they will do probably is go, oh, just listen to the new, new song on the advert. You know, it's actually Fleetwood Mac and you can listen to it here on Spotify. You know, and that's what, what they do on Twitter. So the question really is like, are we moving to in a direction where we're measuring what people are interested in and what's popular, or do we still want to measure what actually people buy? Because I think, I think what we see is that that's the smaller figure. 
uh, two questions to Manfred. Uh, would you agree to him? Uh, first question. The other is, the history of charts is a history of bribery and fake. And, okay, we do it later. That's, that's, uh, a, that's a good question, but I think we're opening up a, a Pandora's box by asking this now. Uh, <laughs> No, but uh, I think the, the question is really what was earlier, the egg or the hen, you know. Uh, I think these, these two things are, are very related and basically, of course, uh, people who c consume music or consume anything, they don't care so much uh, how, how many other people bought this, but they want to know who else loves what I'm, I love. Uh, so, so, but then we have an industry who's producing these things and he wants to live of these things, so so they have to look very good at this and have to uh, translate this into their marketing actions. So it's always, yeah, there was always things like that. And uh, if, if you did these lists as a DJ, you were measuring the interest of, of the audience. Uh, the uh, the shops did the list and they were, were doing this. Uh, and there we, we can say sometimes uh, because the people were coming in and were asking for the latest album by whoever, uh, and sometimes they were just giving some p promotional stuff from the record company or even some better things. Uh, and then they were listing this. And this was the Stone Age era of charts. And uh, I, I have to, to do this, this uh, mention this here. I mean, when, when the CDs started, uh, I was the first one to introduce with a small hi-fi magazine CD charts. And this was done by somebody who was sitting there who was calling 30 shops uh, each month and who was asking them how many CDs did you sell off this list. And then we had a, a list of tw uh, top 20, I think. And of course, the record labels, which were mainly classical by, back then when the CD started, they were very interested in, in, in looking at this. And then they said, hey, uh, we, we do some marketing about this. And you never could tell how these charts were really. So we are much better now because we, we, we have algorithms, we have measures to, to see the interest and the consumption. Did so this? this is a sensation, an earthquake in the German charts. Uh, please uh, have a look. I don't know how earthquakey this is. Maybe some percentage of digital and analog. Because um, He's looking at the sensation, and I ask a question. Uh, that's uh, so a long <laughs> thing. That's a long thing. <laughs> okay, one thing. Doo -doo. Which came in through Twitter, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, this does. It's this too complicated. Starts, this <laughs> this starts are quite well normal. Uh, they so still work no with sensation. GFK Entertainment. By the way, Matthias Gillot, who was. Uh, uh, who was supposed to be on this panel, he's really ill, uh, so he, he couldn't come and that's, that was my chance to so sit here. So what did they change? Uh, well, I still look, I'm still searching for this in this <laughs> long text. <laughs> that's a good just go on, ah, okay. maybe I find something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah n and not so breaking news. <laughs> uh, would you say, uh, if you compare this, uh, maybe you have, uh, do you know this book Hitman, it's from the stone age of American industry with mafia, with everything, with all the hitmen who bribe radio DJs to fake the charts and all that. Okay. Do you think this is impossible or not possible today because of all the digital media and uh, so the age of fake is more or less over? I think so, yeah. Um, you know, coming from Shazam's perspective, we uh, we take kind of uh, precautions to make sure you, that you can't rig the charts. You know, the the automatic assumption would be that you just get your intern to Shazam your latest artist yeah. song hundreds, thousands of times a week, and it will yeah. climb up the Shazam charts. Uh, that's not possible. So if anyone's done that, don't do it. Um, but we, you know, we track device ID, so you can take a device ID, and then yeah. that counts to one chart position, but not 1,500. So for Shazam, there is no need to fake the charts. Um, well, people would like to, I think, yeah. because uh, you know, if you get to the number one in Shazam charts and it's your first single, it's probably a good story. But we make sure that they don't, because it's the only fair barrier. Uh, I think Spotify. We talked about the mighty position in Scandinavia, uh, in different countries, uh, are more uh, competitors. So, do you think Spotify and the 
ruling or the, the music industry? Do you think there are problems or is the music industry accepting uh, the stream system? Although, would you say it's a good relationship between the old music industry and the new one? Well, it's definitely a difficult one. So that's the main challenge of my job, I would say. But um, I think we are we're getting embraced, and I think we just saw that streaming is is part of the German single charts. It's great, and we want to be part of that. Um, which one thing which with bothers us a little bit is that only premium streams are counted into that system. So we would love to see that also free uh, from our free users would be accounting for that system, of course, because we think they're as valuable as premium streams because they're also consumption and that really also shows what people are interested in are into, even though they're not paying for a premium account. So that's something we, of course, would like to see, but I think that, of course, it's a long way, especially for, for those guys who are in this industry for like 30 or 40 years to really make their head around about the whole consumption purchase thing. But um, I think we, we've done a good job in educating those people and we see that there's a lot of people embracing new opportunities and embracing new kind of campaigns we can do to, to break artists, for example. And I think we're on a good way. So Manfred, is there a sensation? <laughs> yeah, I, I found a sensation quote. And it says, tweets and likes can be very volatile. In the end, only sales and consumption decisions by the consumers, by the listeners, decide, are decisive for our charts. And therefore, our official charts uh, have, are giving the best picture of what's going on out there. Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, well, maybe they did this because they knew we were sitting here, but I think, uh, well, and, but then it says in the end, the synopsis, the official German charts, they have always been uh, integrating new formats and therefore were always uh, quite in, in sync with what's happening out there. Uh, and therefore, the importance for the consumers are as important, as big as ever. And they give a, also an important orientation for labels, for commerce and the media. And so that's uh, the, the, the reason why our uh, charts will be and will stay important in the future. <laughs> That's it. Uh, it sounds a little bit it has come from East Berlin or from East Germany, from the Neues Deutschland or something, also, or the not so new Deutschland. Well, uh, a, a spontaneous uh, comment on this. Uh, maybe I'll write next week in a propos uh, in Musikwoche, which I'm doing from time to time. Uh, well, what else should they say about this system which exists? So the, the real news is uh, we, we did a, the, a, the contract with GFK again. We prolonged it. We did not work with media control again like before. Uh, we did not work with others who probably pitched for this. So, and of course, yeah, they just underlined the function of the official charts, which uh, really is okay. But uh, there's other things, and we've been discussing. The, uh, we were right in the middle of, of doing this, so let's go on. So, 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 what is the reason the traditional GFK is uh, based on this sales system? It's a big business. Also, statistic is a business. Or otherwise, it couldn't uh, be more open. Well, the GFK is a uh, well. It's always let's say it's a it's a big established system. And they've grown, and they've not only they not only do the music charts before they did other things, and they still do lots of other things like media control also did and does. So uh, these systems, as long as they work, and they tend to work for a long time, they can go on. And even if there are others coming up, other new systems, I know this uh, because it's it's on a big scale and also in a, in a small scale and with us uh, at Musikwoche we realized there was music metrics starting with a p2p download real time chart some years three years ago there were some coming in there's twitter and all these things and and it also takes us some time to 
incorporate this into our charts pages because we love to do all the charts we can get, basically. But uh, you have to uh, you have to get links, you have to program it, you have to work on it. You need power, you need people. Yeah, people. Who do it, and you know. So, uh, did the digital colleagues? Uh, do you think this traditional GFK or BPI or in America it's done by Billboard or whatever is collapsing or do you think either you, on one hand it's uh, like a revolution or you could have an evolution that um, more and more digital uh, facts and figures are going inside the official GFK thing and at the end of the day I think it's an economical fight. Well, I think that the main question is what's relevant. Yeah. I think I think that's it's a relevance question, and I think um, for for GFK Media Control, their relevance obviously is how many are being sold because uh, record labels obviously want to sell records and they want to make money with that, which which is fine. So, um, I'm, from Twitter perspective, um, I'm I'm a bit disappointed, especially because they say that tweets are volatile. Um, because we can see that they're not. We can see uh, artists break and we have signings because of Twitter. We have even in the US signings because of Vine, our like a six second video platform, where we have artists that, that grow really big. Um, you've seen the, we've, we've seen that with YouTube in the past years. We're moving now with, with Twitter signings. And we can see which artists are going to be breaking, which is important to the, to the label industry because they can see uh, who are they signing, which ones from their artists uh, you know, gain traction and, uh, and can push them more. Uh, the same thing probably goes with Shazam. Like if I can see that this song is gaining traction and I've got the possibility to go into the charts because at the moment, like Shazamming and sales are in sync. Um, I'm just calling Shazamming. I don't know if that's the official word. <laughs> and um, you know, and and as long as this this happens now for Twitter, that isn't important. Like like I don't I don't want to to make graphs and say like look this this you know was tweeted about that many times and like I don't know three months later he's number one in the charts because that's not important because uh, for us it's important are people talking about it? are they relevant to an audience do people like this artist do they want to talk about their artist then he's relevant or she you know and uh, and as long as she's relevant people like her we can say look you know because that will go anyway because the, the thing with Twitter is it's very democratic because we've got no catalog. Like, you know, I can only stream things on Spotify that are on there, and I can only Shazam songs that are played somewhere. Like, Twitter, we're like, I think, in the beginning of the whole value chain. Like, people talk about what they like, and, and you don't need to be on Twitter for people to talk about it. You know, and, uh, and I think that's, that's why it's very democratic, and it seems very chaotic. So we need very good algorithms to, to filter that out. But we can say what people are talking about and what the, the basic mass, what's standing out of there. So um, I can understand from GFK that's probably too complicated for them because they like to look at their sheets and Excel sheets and go, go you know, this is, this is it. And um, I, that will change because it's changing already. And we know it's changing. We know there's young people uh, not buying uh, records anymore, but streaming them or shazamming them or tweeting about them. So it's just a matter of time. And if they want to wait, fair enough. That's all I can say to that. Uh, so what I would suggest, if there are questions from you, you um, um, if there are questions, please ask. Otherwise, we try to look in the future, to the future, what will happen in five or six or whatever years. So, but you want to say something? Just two sentences, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I think that's that's really the, the core of the controversial uh, thing uh, is uh, volatility, vol volatility versus solidity, and of course you have these two. Uh, contradictory issues there and they probably will always be like that because yeah there's some certain and the volatility has increased with the internet in all levels with ev all th uh, things and on the other hand you have well solidity you have factors Helena Fischer. like Helena Fischer for instance see so so other questions hello ah okay we're gonna have one question here Hello, uh, my name is Ronnie Krieger. I have uh, two comments or questions, if you like. One, you said that uh, you asked a question about fake and the modern times, if fake is over or whatever, and you said Shazam takes measurements. I used to work for Beatport. We took measurements as well, but there were several companies who made a business out of it to be one step ahead of us. So, you know, there is never going to be an end to fake because people will always find ways. If it's relevant to be in any chart, people f will find a way to trick their way into it. But it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme 
because the majority is still relevant and there will be some examples which you will find out and then you'll kick them out and then they'll find new ways to do it. But there will always be an element of fake. That's one thing. And then the other thing is I really think that just the main topic of this discussion is like there are a lot more different charts to look at. But the charts that we're talking about here is the old school chart. They are called sales charts. So they will always going to be based on revenue that has been made with a purchase. And that's still very relevant. The fact that is so bad about them is that they're so not going with technology. Like I just came back from a four weeks trip to America and everywhere you go, when you pay a taxi, when you pay for something in a store, a minute later, I have my receipt in my email account. And you know, as you know from streaming services, from YouTube, whatever, all these statistics come in in real time. And with the chart, people are sitting and waiting and waiting and waiting to get the results later. There's really no reason for that. You know, Basically, if someone buys a CD in a store, the information of that purchase could be somewhere live in a couple of minutes later. So that's where these companies really fail who are doing the statistics to go with technology, make use of it, and keep track with Shazam, with Twitter, with all these Spotify charts, etc. And it's technically possible. It's just a big change for them, and they are not doing it. Manfred, do you think uh, it's too complicated or too expensive for the traditional ones to do all these technical things? Well, there's certainly some some degree of complicated matters there, but uh, I don't think that's the reason because, it, well, yeah, it, it's something in the heads too and in, in the way people are used to work with these instruments. So, uh, of course, I, I dare say that everybody in, in the music business is working with uh, these charts, be it Twitter or Shazam or Spotify. And maybe in Sweden it's, it's more developed already because you can already see that Spotify used translates into sales with albums and, and, and single tracks. So uh, that's, that's also that, that's, that's a development and I think it's, it's going to change as it has changed all, during all these years. But of course there's a big, a big system there and uh, yeah, the, you, the, the question is how to monetize uh, these things and as long as uh, th this isn't accountable and maybe it doesn't care. Uh, let's remind of uh, things like, like uh, back in the 80s there was New Age, a big wave, and it was not reflected in the official charts. You could sell 100,000 records, same thing with, with metal, uh, you could sell 100,000 records as long as you were not in the sample of, of uh, dealers who were reporting. Uh, it, it, you didn't show up in these charts and it, the people who sold the records didn't care about this. They complained from time to time and then they introduced the uh, via phone on it, via the, via the computer system, like SoundScan in, in, in the US. And, and then, of course, it changed a bit, which also was visible immediately, because before, uh, top 10 records tended to stay there for months and months and months. It was quite conservative. And then, uh, when, uh, the first time you had the electronic system, well, you had a number one record heavy by a heavy metal band coming in at one and then descending very fast because everybody had bought this. So we, we have a reflection of how consumers behave and we still have in these charts. And maybe uh, it, it would be wise to uh, integrate all these other aspects. But then there's another question which uh, can be probably not yet not discussed here uh, with the rest of this time. How do you uh, find a system to uh, a scale for for the worth of sales, you know, because how do you incorporate streamings? And we we, we have all these calculations, and uh, and and some of uh, people are quite happy about it. Others complain, and so so these things have to be uh, get, uh, have to develop into a balance, I think. And this will take time. And of course, it's always a question if a, a system works. And it's always the, the first that you, you create a system and you define parameters to have it working. And if it works, it tends to perpetuate itself. But unless you uh, feed some new uh, system, uh, uh, some new uh, things into it and maybe the algorithms with just counting what's going on at Spotify or Twitter or so forth are... Uh, truer than uh, a system which is based on 50 pages of uh, 
of uh, regulations and uh, price, fixed prices and things like that, and adequations between streaming and download and these things. So these are quite interesting matters. I could go on for hours, but I don't think that. Uh, uh, so is there a new, a new age channel on uh, Spotify? Although it he mentioned it. Definitely is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the great thing about our service is that users are democratic and that users can follow each user. And if there is a new age playlist which is really famous and which is made by someone who really cares and who is really interested in a the topic, then it will gain a lot of followers. So it's not necessarily made by us, it's made by someone who really is into that genre. And I think that's the interesting thing. And one thing I wanted to add is that I think there are two sides of things here. One thing is that you want to know how much you've earned and then you look into the sales charts. The other thing is what can you learn about your fans? And that's, I think, something where the three of us can add a lot of, a lot, add a lot of value because um, our system and our analytic system that's provided to labels and where we also have like collaborations with Next Big Sound, for example, which allows you to see statistics on your Twitter or Facebook audience, for example, you can see the streams that happened yesterday. So it's not real time, but we're getting there. So we're working on that, but you can see immediately if there was a certain event somewhere or you've had like a TV appearance, then you will see that your streams went up in a certain territory and you not only know the territory, you will know which sex the, the person had, where it was, um, which time, how much they streamed it, and you will know a lot more about the fan, fans you're having than you knew like 10 years ago. And I think it's really interesting to see the potential of this data because we are having bands and labels approaching us asking for like the 20 biggest cities in Germany they're streamed in and asking us to plan their tour around this. So there's a huge potential that you can use this data, but it's not leveraged at this point. So I think that's really interesting. Questions? Uh, over there. Hi, my name is Sebastian. Um, as we all know, to uh, reach the masses and to get money by the GEMA, you still really need airplay on official classic radio stations broadcasting. So um, I want to ask you if there's any radio station who plays uh, the Spotify or Shazam charts, and if not, what do you think? How will radio station and Spotify influence each other? Uh, we have two collaborations in Germany. Uh, one is with Big FM, and what the other one is with Kiss FM. They both have a radio chart. Uh, show both on a Saturday, I think, and they are playing the Spotify charts in, uh, in in their region. So it's not only based on the country. You can also break it down on special regions. So, for example, for Big FM, it's their Sendegebiet, and for Kiss FM, it's the the Brandenburg region. So we can definitely break that down to to certain cities or regions, which which is I think really interesting. And they are also picking up viral tracks or tracks that are performing. Is especially in, uh, especially more on streaming or on Spotify than on other channels. So we kind of have the opportunity to work with them on an ed editorial basis as well. So we do that in other territories, but it's, it has been picked up in Germany as well. So what is about uh, öffentlich-rechtliche? Are they allowed to work together with a private company like Spotify or are they not interested because of their own Eins Live or Fritz or I Charts? I think it depends on the station and how they read what they're allowed to do. So we have some uh, public radio stations which are working really, really intense with us. For example, Zündfunk or Bayern 3, they're really moving forward with this. Um, and there are some which are more conservative. They maybe think that streaming is uh, taking away their users and their listeners, which is, which is something you can argue about. Um, I think it really can widen up the audience for radio. So if, for example, Big FM has a playlist which they have and they they add their context and they add their editorial picks in it, it's really interesting for our users to listen to that playlist because maybe they listen to radio in their car and then they want to go back to the music they've heard. So like getting back into the context and see what their editors were picking because we are not... We, we can't be editors all the time, so there are other people providing context. So what is the situation in England? Is, uh, what's about the BBC or the traditional British media and uh, modern institution like Shazam? Are there corporations or yes, brands? Yes, so we, 
I mean, we don't, yeah, there's no official Shazam kind of chart show on, on BBC Radio 1, um, but we, we speak to those guys quite frequently and we know that they keep a keen eye on our charts and they, they've used that as, um, as I, yeah, I mentioned earlier, as, there's a number of services, but Shazam's become increasingly important uh, deciding if something goes up the C list, to the B list, to A list. Um, I think how we've started to work in the last few years um, that's helped, say, artists in particular get on radio um, is, is just getting our data out there. So in the app, you can zoom into any city in the world and see what the, you know, the Shazam chart for that day is in that particular city. Um, we also send out an industry mailer as well, which has, um, in the US specifically, broken down by key radio territories. Um, and there was one example where an artist uh, in the US and their management uh, saw that they, you know, off the back of a few spins in LA, had climbed to say number three in the LA chart for that week. So then they used that as their almost as their bargaining tool to go to other stations and to the stations and say, look, we only got played say ten amounts of times last week, but we're number three in the Shazam charts. You should be playing us more, and and it works. Um, I think from. From that point of view, when you're a manager and you have access to the you know information of how many times your song has been played on radio, and you can equate it to position in Shazam charts, it's quite a valuable tool to you know bring together. Um, so yeah, it is uh, you know back to your question, it is a little bit tricky. I think Radio One is you know the the the, the leading kind of uh, radio station in the UK, but it's not commercial. Um, so to have yeah, the, there's things that we can do with them in terms of conversations, but there's things that we can't do with them as well. <laughs> So uh, we've got five minutes, uh, ten minutes. So questions. Otherwise, I would uh, that we looking in the glass bulb. What will happen in five or six years? Okay, yeah. one question. Yeah. Good. Hello. Ah, there it is. So. Okay, second try. I have one question about the Twitter trends because the, the official charts are obviously very easy to see through. You buy a CD, then it goes in there. Shazam as well, you Shazam a song, it goes in there. But for Twitter, I was thinking that a lot of comments on Twitter are negative as well. I mean, for me, there's a difference between being interested in something and actually liking it. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, that's that's why I said earlier with the with the GFK, I can kind of understand. I, mean, I think that's why I mean, we're, I think Twitter in the whole discussion is kind of plays an, an extra role because um, we're we're an interest, well, we're a platform of interest. So so people talk about everything; they just don't talk about music. Music is a big part on Twitter, um, but obviously it's not the only part. Um, the the thing is that it comes down to algorithms, and we don't have like uh, farms of 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 people somewhere. Uh, scan, sc like, you know, scanning through the whole thing and doing it. Um, we're working like the the algorithm we're doing. We're working with labels at the moment, um, so so they're working on that to help us how we can determine which artists are breaking and which are not. So if you look at it, there are no official Twitter charts as of as of now, because um, because we're doing collaborations that are very exclusive at the moment. Um, but you can obviously everyone can look at the tweets. There's there's lots of third party um, apps and and providers that that can you know provide you with data. And we know labels are using it. Uh, definitely, they they know what's going on. They know how their artists are performing. Uh, they know when they're doing their campaigns. Um, but your question is is completely right. How how do you do it? Um, it can be done. Uh, I know it can be done. Um, because it can be done with anything. I mean, if you look at, at other social media platforms, you always have the same thing. Um, it's just a question of algorithm and of, of really clever computing. And uh, it's sometimes scary how clever computing can be, and especially if you look at all the new apps that are coming out. Um, uh, but I'm thinking, and then we'll talk about the future in the moment, but I think uh, that Twitter will provide a special kind of charts, like Shazam provides a special kind of charts, like Spotify provides special kind of charts, like the GFK provides special kind of sales charts. And these are all relevant in their niche, um, I'm thinking what's relevant to the consumer, and uh, and where do you like which charts do you want to see as a, like all of you um, as a consumer and as industry? What what's really important to you, and um, and I think that's where we have like all different standpoints, um, but in the end they all come together because it's changing, and I think that's the main issue, as well. Yeah, Probably possible, but I, I, I don't want to imagine it because I think uh, there's, there's many reasons 
uh, to, to have a situation like this, which, which is not so bad after all. Uh, like, uh, I want to translate this into the 60s. Uh, there were German Schlager charts and there were German official charts, there were German broadcasting charts and uh, people who cared about music, like myself, they were listening to AFN Top 20, Frolligat 5 once a week, or to BFBS Top 20 Saturday night, and were getting their charts from then. That, that was like Twitter for us, you know? So, because you, you, you then you could say that three, six months after that, you realize, oh, this was it's going to be played in, in the German radio, and you, you, could t you told everybody before, that was my reason to get into this business uh, because I wanted to tell people about what's going on in the music. You know, you know so that's, that, and that's, this will always be like this. The 60s are the solution. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> um, but uh, just let me, let me seed a bit of uh, doubt into everything, uh, which may, it may seem off topic, but I don't think it, it really is. Uh, three days ago, just by chance, I was zapping in TV and I found a chart I hadn't known yet and I was really fascinated. This was North Rhine-Westphalia's top 10 most beautiful mills Chart. Uh, on TV. TV. So number one was a mill, which was quite interesting because it was not run by the wind, it was not run by electricity or whatever. It was not a water mill, no, it was run by horses. So, um, and this, is a mo was the most amazing charts for me, but uh, to be honest, I knew about uh, this, these listings, I never cared about them, but I understand that they are very successful in German television. Uh, they were invented by uh, an editor of Norddeutsche Rundfunk in Hamburg 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, and they're ago. faking it. The, and the, the famous mill faking. So uh, this not is just mills. No, no, you, this you is can bribery. Whatever this you mill want. Is the not most, uh, most beautiful buildings, the most beautiful ships uh, in, in, in the harbor of Bremerhaven, the most beautiful uh, zoo for children in, in the, uh, North Rhine-Westphalia or whatever. This guy. He invented this way back. It was very successful. You saw this by the by the uh, audience quotes. Uh, quote, and then uh, he went to uh, BDR to West Western uh, Public Broadcasting in Cologne. He invented some more lists. Now he's uh, at Süd Südwestfunk in the Southwest. So is he Godfather of charts? On. And we're coming to uh, just to to why the future will always be like that. There will be listings, there will be charts, they will hold a uh, strange or fine fascination for people who uh, are looking at them, who are listening to them, and there's always going to be also, uh, well, uh, frauds and, and manipulations, and because the, the trigger for this, why I was, I was caring for this, was we had this, the, the, the discussion in German public television with the big shows, German is best, it's two months ago where uh, the böse uncles voted. are better had, than Goethe. We had an online voting, and you have online votings, and you have always uh, take uh, be careful what you do with these online votings, because you have always people who use these votings and who, who try to do something with them. And there you can start uh, manipulating it. If you think Angela Merkel has to be number one, you push Helene Fischer down to seven and put her up to number one. Helene Fischer was at one, but... Angela Merkel ended up in, in the broadcast at, at number one, and somebody found out, and this was... Uh, Did Angela so Merkel fake the charts? Uh, no. That's not yet uh, conf confirmed, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> so, how often are mills driven by horses discussed on Twitter? An interesting question, we could find out. Um, um, uh, that's, that's the thing. I think... To, to, to go, go into the future uh, thing, I think what we're discussing is also when we talk about streaming and sales charts, is I think where the music industry is really going. Um, will, will record sales be important? Will uh, streaming be more important? Will live shows be more important? And, um, and nobody knows, obviously, because we've been discussing this for the past years. Like every conference, always the same thing. Online markets is stealing sales here, vinyl's coming back, vinyl's not coming back, all these kind of things. Um, and I think I'm, I'm probably in the best position because <laughs> we're not 
selling any music. We're not, we're not trying to sell music. We're not streaming music. What we're doing is we're just, we're just having people, we're giving a platform for people to discuss things. So if tomorrow mills get really popular, I'm in a brilliant position because people will discuss it on Twitter, right? And, um, and then you'll be like, oh, how can I Shazam mill sounds? <laughs> Right, and, um, and, and you'll be going, how can I stream them? And uh, so, so we're in a good, so I think like the future of charts is also tied to the future of music, like where we're going, what's going to be important. And as you said, what, what niches are going to be important. And uh, I think that's why I'm disappointed by the GFK announcement, because what they're obviously not doing is trying to think ahead with us. I think the child sales charts are really, really important. Don't get me wrong. But I'd like to go new ways. I'd like to, what we're doing, I'd like to see that somewhere so that our users can see it. And at the moment, we're fabricating ourselves and, and we have like our partners working with us. Um, but it'd be nice, especially the whole faking thing, to have somebody like that's independent to kind of come up with algorithms. Like they, they, I mean, you know, you could also argue phoning up record shops. That's not really independent. Like, you know, who chooses those record shops? But, you know, they came up with a system that made, they have a rule book. Now, what we need is a rule book for online as well. And, uh, and I think that's the real question, and that's why I'm disappointed by GFK. Well, what I'm trying to say is, GFK, please, and all others out there, come up with a rule book for online charts that we can all value. So we have to finish this. So if there's someone who is good in nerdism and can write this, uh, how do you call it, this computerized super systems, please contact uh, GFK or whatever. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, so thanks again for this uh, wonderful and interesting discussion about music charts. Are we going to have a um, short or no, no, one hour lunch break? And after the lunch.